Good evening, everybody. We'll, we'll, we'll make a start. I'd like to make a special welcome to the Lord Mayor of Leeds, uh, uh, Councillor Al Garthway, this evening, and uh, uh, consort who are joining us for the lecture, and also to welcome our speaker, Andy Wilson, from Yorkshire Cancer Research, who's going to talk to us tonight about uh, Isaac Berenblaum and the Bari Bonds. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gents. It's a real pleasure to come and join you in this fabulous venue. The best I've been presenting I think, for about 10 years, and it's, I think, the finest venue that I've ever presented. In. So I will do my best to do it justice. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I work for Yorkshire Cancer Research, and I've come along to tell you the story of Berenblum and the Barley Bombs. So it's the story of the discovery of chemotherapy, and I'm going to tell you the real story and the full story. So if you were to meet a man or woman in the street, and they said to you, oh, I know the story of chemotherapy, I'll tell it to you. I, I realise that's unlikely, but if you did, <laughs> I guarantee you they would only tell you half the story but they would think that they told you the whole story because half the story has come to be recognized around the world as being the full story. So tonight you're gonna to get a lot. And I'm gonna tell you also about a Leeds-based cancer researcher called Isaac Berenblum, uh, who was funded by Yorkshire Cancer Research back in the 1920s and who, um, unwittingly in a way, made a contribution to the discovery of chemotherapy. That's in there. But we begin the story in Italy and we begin down on the southeast coast of Italy uh, in the city of Bari, which nowadays sounds like really quite a pleasant place to go and have a holiday. Uh, it's got an old town called Bari Vecchio, which has got lots of narrow alleyways and um, markets and shady piazzas. And in the biggest piazza, there is this beautiful white church, the Basilica of St. Nicholas. And the, there are relics of St. Nicholas in there, been there since the 1200s, and Catholic pilgrims have been coming to Bari ever since. It's got a nice modern marina, and just over the back of those houses is an enormous industrial port, which is going to be very important to our story, and we're going to hear a lot more about it later on. Um, it's reputed to have some of the finest coastline in the whole of Italy around it, and it's got quite a sleepy, laid-back reputation. So quite a nice place to go for a holiday now, but quite a different situation back in 1943. Because in July 1943, we get Operation Husky, which was the beginnings of the liberation of Italy from German control. But to understand Operation Husky, we need to go back a little bit further in time, back to October 1942, and the very famous Battle of El Alamein, which was an absolutely brutal tank battle, lasted two weeks in the Egyptian desert, which eventually saw Montgomery's Eighth Army triumph over Rommel's combined German and Italian troops. And it prompted Winston Churchill's, well, one of his most famous quotes of World War II, this is not the end, this is not even the beginning of the end, but it may just be the end of the beginning. And it is always a massive relief when I get that out, and it comes out in the right order. It doesn't always, <laughs> it did tonight, so that's good. Um, what it certainly was, was the beginning of the end of the war in North Africa, or the Desert War, as it was called, um, because by the following spring, about a quarter of a million German and Italian troops had surrendered, and that left tens of thousands of Allied troops in North Africa with nothing much to do. And of course, the War Office couldn't afford for that situation to last for very long. So a plan was hatched to use those troops to begin the liberation of Italy. But before that happened, there was a very famous act of subterfuge called Operation Mincemeat, which you've probably all heard about because a book was written about it a few years ago. And then a couple of years ago, a film came out about it, which I have to say is very, very good if you do come across it. It's well worth a watch. I won't go into it too much other than to say that Operation Mincemeat successfully convinced the Germans that the Allies were not going to invade Italy, but in fact were going to invade Greece. And it did actually mean that the Germans moved some troops from Italy to Greece, but there were still a huge number of German and Italian troops defending Italy. So we get 150,000 troops in 3,000 boats moving along the north coast of Africa towards the southwest coast of Sicily, and they get support from 4,000 aircraft and 600 tanks, and they attack all along that southwest coast of Sicily. And even though some troops had been moved away, there were still around 70,000 German and Italian troops defending Sicily. And the battle to take it was 
incredibly intense. It took six weeks, and it's thought that each side lost at least 20,000 men. So it's, again, another brutal battle. But eventually the Allies succeeded in taking Sicily. The Germans evacuated about 50,000 troops and all the tanks and ammunition that they possibly could, and then the, the, the Allies had controlled Sicily and used it as the base to begin the liberation of Italy. So after a couple of weeks of recuperation in September 1943, we see the beginnings of the attack on the mainland. And the first attack is Operation Baytown, which is again Montgomery's 8th Army going across to the very tip of the toe of Italy to the town of Reggio and managing to take it. And then six days later, we get two more operations on the same day. So in Operation Avalanche, American troops took the town of Salerno, but came under incredibly heavy fire, way heavier than they'd anticipated. There was a, a raging battle to take Salerno, but eventually the Americans managed to take it. And uh, as I say, then on the same day, and it's good to know that somebody in the war office was having some fun because in Operation Slapstick, the British took Taranto and found it more or less undefended and pretty much just marched up the beach and uh, secured Taranto. From there, those troops made quite hasty progress up the coast and eventually took the city of Bari. And Bari was absolutely crucial to this plan to take to, to, to liberate Italy because Bari had an enormous industrial commercial port. And the Allies had realized that if they were to succeed in taking Italy, obviously they were gonna to need to move in a lot more troops and a lot more ammunition and, and other uh, cargo that was required. And that this harbor would be crucial to doing that. So within several weeks of taking it, this harbor had been floodlit and there were ships queued up 24 hours a day to come in, be unloaded and move back out again. Now the harbor had some fairly rudimentary uh, air defense around it that was already there, but really it didn't amount to very much. And the Allies decided not to invest in putting any more air defences around the harbour, partly because they were so stretched that it would have been difficult, but also because they'd received intelligence that said that the Luftwaffe was so fully stretched across the rest of the Mediterranean that they wouldn't be able to muster enough planes to attack the harbour. Unfortunately, that intelligence was completely wrong. On the 2nd of December 1943, one lone Luftwaffe pilot flew over Bari Harbour, realised that it was pretty much undefended and realised how busy it was and how important it was to the Allied war effort. When he landed, he immediately filed a report and that report through the rest of the day made its way from desk to desk to desk up the German High Command until it ended up on the desk of General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, one of Adolf Hitler's most trusted lieutenants in charge of the whole Mediterranean war effort on behalf of Germany. And Albert Field Marshal uh, sorry, General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring decided to take immediate action and ordered an attack on the Bari Harbour that very evening. So at half past seven that night, about 100 German aircraft attacked Bari Harbour. Uh, the damage was absolutely colossal. 27 ships were sunk and over 2,000 service personnel and civilians died. It puts it on a scale almost the same as the much more famous Pearl Harbour. Everybody's heard about Pearl Harbour, hardly anyone has heard about Bari Harbour, but the scale was similar. Now, incredibly unfortunately, there were two ammunition ships in the harbour that night, and they both received direct hits, and they went up with explosions that shattered windows seven miles away from Bari. So you can only imagine what it could have been like to be anywhere near that harbour on that evening. Extremely unfortunately, there was a third cargo ammunition ship in the harbour that night, and this was an absolutely top secret ammunition ship. It was the SS John Harvey. And the SS John Harvey had come across from America with a top secret cargo of around 2,000 mustard gas bombs in its hold. A cargo so top secret that even the ship's captain, Elwyn Knowles, was not supposed to know what was on board. Why was this so top secret? Well, it was because in 1925, the major countries of the world had come together to sign a treaty to ban the use of chemical weapons in warfare. Fantastic, a great step forward for the world. However, that treaty had its certain limitations because although it banned the use of chemical weapons in warfare, it did not ban the manufacturing of chemical weapons and it did not ban the stockpiling of chemical weapons. And because in the aftermath of World War I, the major countries of the world did not trust each other very much, most of the major countries went on manufacturing and stockpiling chemical weapons. So 
we get this ship secretly coming across the Atlantic. They, I should say about the mustard gas. So inside those bombs there, the, the mustard gas would be in liquid form, generally transported as a liquid, but it very easily turns into a vapor. Uh, it's a yellowish color, which is where the name comes from. And it also has a mustardy, horseradishy kind of smell, apparently. So quite an acrid smell. And mustard gas is very, very bad for humans. So mustard gas will strip the membranes from the eyes, causing temporary or permanent blindness. It will strip the membranes from the mouth, throat, and lungs, causing difficulty in swallowing and also difficulty in breathing. And it will incredibly badly burn the skin. And as we're going to see later on, chemical weapons, including mustard gas bombs, were widely used during World War I. And there was so much revulsion from their use during that war that that's why the 1925 treaty came about. Why were these bombs being moved to Italy when it was illegal for them to be used? Well, the Allies were concerned that as the tide of the war started to turn against the Germans, that the Germans would resort to using their own supplies of chemical weapons. And if they did, the British, the British and the Allies wanted to have their own supply ready in order to be able to fire back. Hence, we get the SS John Harvey in Bari Harbour on the fateful evening of the attack. And the SS John Harvey, unfortunately, also receives a direct hit and explodes. And 2,000 mustard gas bombs worth of mustard gas explodes out into the water and into the air around the harbour. So a couple of photographs from the aftermath. So this is the morning after. Now this chap here is being, he's having his arm held. He is possibly already beginning to suffer temporary or permanent blindness. And then we've got some young Italian boys here gainfully helping to get people to a jeep in order to get them to the hospital. Now there was an act of kindness on behalf of the rescuers that morning that unfortunately unwittingly was an act of cruelty because, because the ship was top secret, nobody knew that there was mustard gas in the harbor. So when the, uh, army personnel were uh, pulled from the water, obviously they were cold, so they were wrapped tightly in blankets in order to try to keep them warm to get them to the hospital. But wrapping them in blankets only pushed their mustard gas infused clothing tighter onto their bodies and actually made the burning much, much worse, but they weren't to know. A uh, photograph of a couple of chaps there on the, on the dock, trying to put the fires out, and a very evocative photograph. We've got one lone oarsman paddling around the harbour, just trying to find any other survivors. Everybody who did survive the attack but was injured was taken to Bari Hospital, which, as you can imagine, was incredibly quickly, completely overrun and chaotic. Um, and the medics there could not understand the nature of many of the injuries that they were seeing. Why were people going blind? Why were people's skin so badly burned? Why were they struggling to breathe? They didn't understand because they didn't know that there was mustard gas in the harbour. Situation worsened and worsened, and rumours started to circulate that the Germans had dropped chemical weapons during the bombing room. And the British, the Allies, sorry, panicked. They did not want that rumour to circuit to spread. They didn't want any association between chemical weapons and the situation in Bar. However, there was a willingness or a, a desire to tell the staff in the hospital that they were dealing with mustard gas patients in order to help them to cope with the situation. But could they tell them because it was all top secret? And apparently that question as to whether to tell the staff at the hospital or not went all the way up to Winston Churchill. And it was Winston Churchill's decision to say, no, I'm sorry, but we absolutely cannot tell them what has happened because if word gets around that we have chemical weapons in that harbor, it will give the Germans carte blanche to start to use their chemical weapons supplies. So I'm sorry, but no, we are not going to tell it. So, the secrecy was uh, maintained. As the situation continued to further worsen, the Americans sent their best man to Bari, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander. Now, he was a leading medic, but also America's most experienced um, chemical weapons expert. The minute that he walked into Bari Hospital, he knew exactly what he was seeing. He knew he was seeing mustard gas casualties, and he ordered the staff there to start to treat for the effects of mustard gas. He reported that back up his own chain of command and it was completely denied. They told him he was wrong, but he knew he was right and he, made, he continued to maintain that the hospital should treat for mustard gas injuries. An incredibly bright chap. I cannot imagine that he had much time to himself during this whole chaotic situation, but in the time that he did have, he studied the registers of the time that the, um, the military personnel had been brought in from the harbour and studied their injuries 
and then went down to the harbour and drew a map of where all the wrecks were. And from comparing the list of casualties to the map of the harbour, he worked out that it was the SS John Harvey that had had the mustard gas bombs on board. He reported that back up his chain of command and again it was completely denied. What mustard gas bombs they said? So the reason that we're interested in Bowery Harbour and Stuart, Colonel, Colonel Stuart Alexander uh, in terms of the story of chemotherapy is that he filed an interesting report after he finished his time in Bowery, his final report of the Bowery mustard gas casualties. One of the paragraphs in there read, there were two peak points in deaths on the third day and the ninth day. The first peak related to the effects of the burns and the mustard gas. The second peak represents the effects of lung inflammation imposed on patients with low counts of white blood cells. And it's this last bit that's crucial to us this evening. Our white blood cells are an incredibly important part of our immune system. So what he's saying there is basically that people were having these lung issues and their own immune system was being basically inactive and not helping because the mustard gas had killed off the vast majority of the white blood cells in these people's systems. Now then, that man or woman that you met in the streets who wanted to tell you this story about chemotherapy, they would have told you everything I've told you so far, and it's all true. And then they would have said, aha, you see, and then this report went back to America and two incredibly bright chaps saw this report, Alfred Gilman and Lewis Goodman. They saw this report and they had a light bulb moment in which they said, ah, interesting. If mustard gas can kill white blood cells, which are fast dividing cells, Perhaps it can also kill cancer cells, which are also fast dividing cells. Now, unfortunately, that light bulb moment never happened because this is the bit of the story that doesn't hang together very well. Now, I'm not downplaying Gilman and Goodman. They're incredibly important to the story. We're coming back to them later. Um, but that light bulb moment never happened. To understand the whole story fully, we need to go back a bit further in time and go back to World War I. In fact, we go back to July 1917 and uh, the Battle of Passchendaele near Ypres in Belgium. And one night in July 1917, a foggy night, the Germans fired the first ever volley of mustard gas bombs across the battlefield towards British and Canadian troops in trenches, as I say, near, near the town of Ypres in Belgium. These soldiers woke up in the morning to discover what they described as a strange horseradish kind of smell pervading the battlefield and a very strange yellowy green fog, a cloud across the battlefield. Um, now, I should say, in the interest of fairness, that the Germans were not the first to use chemical weapons during World War I. That was, in fact, the French who fired chlorine bombs at the Germans. But the Germans were the first to use mustard gas. However, again, in the interest of fairness, I should say that as soon as that volley was fired, you can bet your life that the Allies got very interested in developing their own mustard gas bombs. And during the rest of the war, they liberally fired them back at the Germans. So I'm not saying it's all bad Germans and fantastic Brits, etc. It's not the case. But the very first volley of mustard gas bombs were fired by the Germans. 2,000 men, sorry, were killed or injured just from that one volley of bombs that night and from that point onwards the use of mustard gas bombs became hugely feared by everyone involved during world war one the nurses working in the field hospitals behind the front lines would report that for most injuries no matter how traumatic they were soldiers would try to cope with them stoically and not complain and just stick up a lip and grin and bear it but it was different for the mustard gas victims. Blinded, throat burning, struggling to breathe, skin on fire. They were so miserable that they would scream and cry out and it was just an awful, awful situation. Very famous photograph from World War I. A line of troops either temporarily or permanently blinded by mustard gas, holding on to each other as they get moved back from the front line to a hospital. And then I feel so, I've seen this photograph so many times that every time I show it, I feel so sorry for this young man. If it was in colour, his face would be all red, completely inflamed, and he's got some huge blisters coming. So, um, oops, no. use that. Okay, so as I say, red inflamed face, he's got uh, blisters coming here on his neck, he's got a huge one under his armpit, there's more coming on his wrist here, another one coming under that armpit there, and his eyes are closed, so I'm guessing temporarily or permanently blinded. 
as well. By the end of World War I, it's estimated that there were over 1 million casualties and over 90,000 deaths attributable to the use of mustard gas and other chemical weapons. Now, working in the field hospitals behind the American troops in the front line in France were this married couple, Edward Bell Crumhar and Helen Dixon Crumhar. They were doctors and pathologists. And they treated patients, injured soldiers, but they also did the autopsies on the bodies of dead soldiers. Working in field hospitals, it would have looked something like that. And they discovered in 2017 that mustard gas exerts a direct toxic action on bone marrow, depleting white blood cells. So we are 23 years before Stuart <coughs> Alexander in Bali, 23 years earlier, Edward Bell Crumhar and Helen Dixon Crumhar discovered exactly the same thing that mustard gas kills white blood cells. Now this report that they sent back to America was actually covered in the American Medical Journal, which at the time was the most well-read medical journal in the world. And it could have been in 1919 that somebody had that light bulb moment and said, aha, if mustard gas kills vascular white blood cells, perhaps it can kill cancer cells. But with the world in turmoil, during World War I, this opportunity was missed. Unfortunately, nobody did have that light bulb moment upon reading this report, and we move on. We move on to 1921, and Isaac Berenblum uh, arrives in our story, where he enrolls as a medical student at the University of Leeds. And it had been a very long journey for him. So he'd been born into a Jewish family in the Polish, uh, small Polish city of Bialystok. Now that pronunciation, I've been told by a Polish person, my pronunciation is awful, <laughs> but when they gave me the pronunciation, I couldn't manage it. So we'll go with Bialystok this evening. Now Bialystok is close to the Polish um, Russian border. And there are times in history when it has been part of Russia. And there are times in history when it has been part of Poland. It is part of Poland now, but back in 1903, it was in Russia. And it was an unusual small city in that two thirds of the population were Jewish. In 1906, there was a pogrom, an uprising against this Jewish population. And on, in the space of one night, 80 um, Jewish people were killed and at least another 80 were seriously injured. Um, and it caused many Jewish families to flee away from this city. And the Berenblums were one of those families. And they fled to Belgium where they lived for six or seven years but unfortunately, then they had to flee again at the start of uh, World War I and the Germans invaded Belgium and this time they fled to England. And a few years later, Isaac Berenblum finds himself in Leeds, enrolling in, at the university to study medicine, despite having, in his own words, no aptitude or particular liking for the subject, which is a strange state of affairs. Um, in the late 70s, Isaac Berenblum wrote an essay about his life. And this extract comes from that essay and it describes how he managed to find himself in Leeds on a course that he didn't want to do. A significant event which almost ruined my future academic career was some well-meaning advice that I received when I was just a schoolboy of around 15. A friend of the family, an organic chemist by profession, came to visit us and out of politeness he asked me what I intended to do when I left school. I told him that I had a passion for chemistry, but was otherwise not very interested in my studies. If only I could be accepted at the university, despite my poor school record, I should aim at becoming a research chemist, I told him. He asked me how good I was at physics. Uh, pretty poor, I had to reply. What about maths, he asked. Even worse. He shook his head sadly and told me that to be a good chemist, one's physics had to be good. And that, in turn, required advanced mathematics. Now, his information may have been basically sound, but it was psychologically disastrous for me. I took his implied advice so seriously that I gave up on the idea of going into chemistry and eventually enrolled as a medical student, a calling for which I knew in advance I had no aptitude and no particular liking. So bless him. On top of a tough childhood, he ends up at university doing something he really doesn't want to do. But thankfully, he doesn't have to do it for long. His talent as a chemist was quickly spotted and there were many other courses available in Leeds. And within a year, he'd been switched on to a degree which was much more acceptable to him as he started to study physiology and biochemistry. Okay, so that's 1921, he arrives in Leeds. 
1925, a big year in the history of the charity that I work for, Yorkshire Cancer Research. So we were founded in 1925. There was a meeting on the 21st of May at the old medical school. And out of that meeting came the creation of the charity. <coughs> and in the beginning, we had a very grand title. We were the Yorkshire Council of the British Empire Cancer Campaign. It was to become Yorkshire Cancer Research. And they were incredibly good at raising money this newly formed organization. Within a year, they had enough to fund a new department at the University of Leeds, the Department of Experimental Pathology and Cancer Research. So that was created in 1926. Now, the first head of that new department was this chap, Professor Richard Passy. And we've got a quote in one of our annual reports where he says, financially, this department owes its being and indeed its entire maintenance to the support which the Yorkshire Council of the British Empire Cancer Campaign has accorded the university. So since 1926, Leeds has gone on to establish a phenomenal reputation for its cancer research. It's certainly one of the leading cancer research establishments in Britain. Um, so we're very proud that our charity played a significant role in founding it back in 1926. Now, one of the very first recruits into this newly formed cancer research department was young Isaac Berenblum. Um, but his first day at work didn't go that well. He sat down on a tea break and a, a more experienced researcher sat down next to him and uh, he explained what he'd been asked to research. And that researcher said to him, all the worthwhile experiments on the subject have already been done, lad. So <laughs> don't waste your time. But anyway, thankfully, he stuck to his guns and did what he was told to do. What had he been asked to do? Well, he'd been asked to find out if cancers grow more quickly on areas of skin which have a rich blood supply. And there's reason to think that they might do. So the blood brings oxygen and nutrients to all parts of our body. So would a skin cancer grow more quickly if that skin cancer was growing in an area that had a rich blood supply and was receiving lots of oxygen and nutrients? You might think that it should do. Did it? That's what he was asked to, actually asked to find out. So he set about thinking about how he could research this question and he decided to use, a, 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 well, even at that time, a very well-known biological function called hyperemia. So if I was to stand here for the next 20 minutes and vigorously rub my arm, we can all appreciate that in 20 minutes time, I would have a red arm. Why would my arm be red? Well, it would be red because by doing this for 20 minutes, I would have depleted the oxygen in the skin cells in this area. They would send a message to my brain saying, we are lacking oxygen, do something about it, please. And my brain would respond by opening up the blood capillaries in my arm in order to flood more blood to the area. And the reason my arm goes red is that there is just more blood there on the surface of the skin. As I said, well-known, perfectly normal biological function. So how was this of use to Isaac Berenblum? Well, he decided that he would take a group of mice and split them in half. So he get two groups of mice. And onto the backs of one of the groups of mice, he would paint a carcinogenic tar. Again, something that was well known about in the 20s. This was like a road tar, sticky tar, but it was well known to cause cancer. So if you painted it onto the back of a mouse, where it was painted on, a cancer would develop underneath almost invariably. So he was going to take half the mice and paint this cancer-causing tar onto their backs. And then with the other half of his mice, he was going to paint the same cancer-causing tar onto them. But before he did that, he was going to mix in something which would irritate the skin, so that these other half of the mice would have the cancer causing tar and a skin irritant also. And then he would see, does the cancer grow more quickly in the irritated skin mice or in the non-irritated skin mice? Now his first idea of a, a skin irritant was something called CO2 snow. So he added it into his tar mixture and then was dismayed to discover that it just made the tar mixture too runny and it would not stay in place properly on the backs of the mice. So he had to think again. And we're just at the back of, well, very soon after World War One here. So I imagine he didn't have to think too hard before his thoughts fell on a very effective skin irritant, mustard gas. So he got hold of some mustard gas and mixed in a very dilute measure, 0.1% mustard gas added into his tar mixture. And then he painted that mixture onto the back of his other half of his mice. And he sat back to watch what would happen. I imagine, no surprise to him whatsoever, that 100% of the mice who just got the carcinogenic tar, they all developed skin cancers. But to his very great surprise, in the other group, the mustard gas and the tar mixture, only 8% of the mice developed skin cancer. What he had discovered, to his astonishment, and quite by accident, was 
a chemical which could, in his own words, inhibit cancer. Or to put that another way, he had discovered a chemical therapy for cancer. Or to put that in one more way, he had discovered a chemotherapy. Chemotherapy just being a shortening of chemical therapy. Now, I can't uh, give him the credit for coming up with the word chemotherapy. That was a German researcher called Early, but he is one of the very first people in the world to discover a chemotherapy. So that's 1929. Two years later, across the Atlantic in New York, two more researchers, not the two that I mentioned earlier, these two different researchers, Frank Adair and Halsey Bag, begin to experiment with mustard gas in this hospital, the most prestigious hospital in America at the time, the Memorial Hospital in New York. They do some mouse experiments. They've seen Baron Brum's results crossing leads, so they copy it and do their own mouse experiments to see if they'll get the same results, and lo and behold, they do. So they take the brave step of beginning to experiment on humans with this mustard gas mixture. They managed to successfully treat 13 skin cancer patients, and they only tried to treat 13 patients, so 100% success rate. One of their reports reads, the tumor has been destroyed gradually, and at present there is no evidence of the disease, and there is good healing over the site of the original tumor. Now, you would imagine that having successfully treated 13 out of 13 skin cancer patients, these two men would want to dedicate probably the rest of their lives to developing this apparently magical um, cancer therapy. For whatever reason, and I can't find out the reason why, they got this far and then abandoned it. Whether they had other contracts that they had to go mm. to, I don't know. But anyway, they write a final report in which they conclude that this, they hope that this preliminary report may suggest possibilities to other investigators and they leave it there and go off and do other things. So the whole thing stalls for another decade, unfortunately. And now we move forward to 1942 and we introduce the two chaps that we did meet earlier on, Alfred Gilman and Lewis Goodman. And they were uh, doctors with a specialism in lymphoma, which is a type of cancer which affects the lymphatic system. So we have in our bodies a lymphatic system which looks something like that similar to the much more well-known about blood circulation system, um, a series of uh, pipes, basically, and, and nodes, you can see there. Uh, and our lymphatic system does several very important things on our behalf, so it will maintain our blood body fluid levels at the right level. It will take the waste products that come out of cells and get rid of them. And perhaps most importantly, it allows for the circulation of white blood cells. This very important part of our immune system. The most common type of white blood cell is the uh, lymphocyte. And in our lymphatic system, we have billions and billions and billions of lymphocytes. They reckon that if you could get all of the lymphocytes out of you and hold them in your hands, they would be about the same size as your brain. The mass would be about the same size as your brain. We've got so many of them in our bodies circulating around. And lymphoma is a type of cancer which, in which these lymphocytes just grow and divide far too quickly. So they will divide before they get to maturity. So they're absolutely useless at fighting a virus and bacteria and infections. They don't do that job whatsoever. All they do is grow and divide, and grow and divide, and grow and divide by the million and then the billion and then the trillion. And they clog up the lymphatic system. And as I say, they don't do anything except get in the way. So they begin to cause swellings in these nodes as they, as they accumulate. That is the cancer that is known as lymphoma. So Gilman and Goodman, having seen what Adair and Bag did in New York and what Bernblum had done in Leeds, they did one single mouse experiment just to check, did they get the same result? And yes, they did. And then they looked around to try to find a patient who um, might volunteer to be a guinea pig for them. Didn't take them long to find him. So this is a chap who's gone down in history known only as JD. And JD was a 48 year old Polish bachelor and he lived in the small city of Meriden in Connecticut. Give you an idea of the geography, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, we'll go back to geography in a second. In April, oh, tell me about Meriden, forgot about that, Meriden. So like, like Sheffield, same reputation as Sheffield, steel working uh, town, very famous for its fine quality cutlery, just like Sheffield. Also famous for its ball bearing manufacturing, and JD worked in a ball bearing factory. And in April 1941, 
He went to a doctor and asked for help because he thought he had a swollen tonsil. Doctor was concerned by what he saw and sent him to hospital for further investigations. Now, okay, now, so now we come to the geography. So Connecticut is just north of New York. So New York City would be down there somewhere. And Meriden is there. And on the coast is New Haven. And New Haven was home to the biggest regional hospital and also home to Yale University. And this is a distance of only about 20 miles. So JD was told that he would have to go down to New Haven to the big hospital for his treatment. When he got there, he received surgery and radiotherapy, but unfortunately it was pretty ineffective. It didn't spot, spread the halt of the cancer. And this is a diagram that was found in his medical notes several years later. And that is the extent of the lump in his neck. So poor, poor man. Must have been absolutely miserable. And a report, uh, sorry, a note in his medical report in August 19, 1942 read, the patient's outlook is utterly hopeless. The end seems near. So Gilman and Goodman were very close by in the university and became aware of JD and went to see him and asked him if he would be willing to take part in their experimental treatment for lymphoma. And with nothing to lose whatsoever, JD said, yeah, let's do it. So on the 27th of August, 1942, JD received his first daily injection of mustard gas and nitrogen. And the results were absolutely miraculous. Within a month, this cancer had completely disappeared. This team must have been cock a hoop This was a phenomenal result, but they just could not believe it. They stopped treating him, but unfortunately, as soon as they stopped, his cancer started oh. to come back. So they started to treat him again, and his cancer disappeared again. But as soon as they stopped the treatment, the cancer came back. So for a third time, they began to treat him, and this time the treatment made no difference whatsoever. And what they had come up against was a problem which has dogged chemotherapy ever since, and that problem is the problem of resistance to the treatment. So I'm going to explain resistance with the help of the chessboard. We have a standard chessboard. 64 squares, eight across and eight deep. If I was to put one grain of rice onto square number one and then double it and put two grains on square number two, four on square number three, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and then I work my way along every line, doubling every time I go from square to square to square, how many grains of rice do we think we're going to need to put onto the last square, square 64? Let's think about it visually. Do we think it would be enough grains of rice to completely cover the floor in this room? Would it be that much rice? Is it going to be less rice? Is it going to be more rice? Do you think? Not a clue. No, not that much. We think maybe not that much. Just too much rice to cover the room. Okay. Well, the number of grains of rice that I would need to put on square sixty-four is precisely. 18.2, oh. 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,614. Don't forget the 14, very important, we need to get them all on. An impossible number for us to begin to even contemplate. So let's, a slightly easier way to think about how big this number is, is to turn it into tons. It would be 1.4 trillion tons of rice that we're trying to get onto <laughs> square 64. Even more helpful, I think, is to think about this visually. So that is enough rice to cover the whole of the surface of India to a depth of one meter. That is up to my hips. Wow. The whole of India to the depth of my hips Gosh. in rice. It's an awful lot of rice. Okay, so let's go back to the chessboard. We can fairly easily turn a chessboard into a calendar because it's got 64 squares, which roughly equates to two months. So we can count this as day one, end of the first month, first day of month two, end of month two, roughly equates. So let's imagine we've got a patient being treated for cancer with chemotherapy. And on day one of it, sorry, on a particular day during this treatment, one single cell becomes resistant to the treatment. And within the next 24 hours, it divides to become two. So on day two, we've got two. Within the space of two months, we've gone from one resistant cell to 18 quintillion resistant cells, just in two months. That is the power of doubling 
And that is why resistance has been such an issue, if you think. So going back to JD, unfortunately he died 96 days after starting his treatment. So it wasn't a life saved, but it was a life extended. But what this did do finally was to give some momentum to chemotherapy. So within um, five months of JD dying, there were 60 more patients across America receiving mustard gas treatment at hospitals. Last, we've got going, we've got momentum. And just to put this into historical context, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander's Bowery Harbor report wasn't even written until the following year. So that light bulb moment never happened. That report was important. It was a bit more fuel on the fire. It helped, but it wasn't the spark that caused the fire to burn in the first place. And chemotherapy has become an incredibly important treatment for cancer patients around the world. About a third of all cancer patients will receive some form of chemotherapy. We currently have over 100 types. And it is really important for treating blood cancers because you cannot use radiotherapy or surgery to treat blood cancers. We have very few treatment options that do include chemotherapy. It will also be used um, to support radiotherapy and, chemo and surgery. So often a patient will have chemotherapy to shrink the tumor and then surgery, possibly radiotherapy, and then more chemotherapy to mop up any stray cells. So it can support at the beginning and at the end. So it is an incredibly important treatment. Now I'm just going to take a moment to tell you about two trials which Yorkshire Cancer Research are currently funding. They're called Foxtrot 2 and Foxtrot 3, and they follow on the heels of an incredibly successful trial called Foxtrot. And I should say, in the interest of fairness, Yorkshire Cancer Research did not fund the first Foxtrot trial. But it was, to say, incredibly effective. Up until the Foxtrot trial came along, the general procedure for a great many bowel cancer patients was that they would have their surgery and then have chemotherapy. The Foxtrot trial came along and said, oh, that's all very good, but what would happen if we gave them chemotherapy beforehand as well as after? So they'd get chemotherapy, surgery, and then more chemotherapy. Would that improve their outcomes? And the Foxtrot trial proved beyond any doubt whatsoever that it did significantly improve the patient's outcomes. So because of the Foxtrot trial, the general procedure in this country and in many countries around the world has changed, and standard procedure now for many bowel cancer patients is chemotherapy first, then surgery, then more chemotherapy. But fantastic. Foxtrot was a huge success, but Foxtrot was not perfect. Foxtrot underrepresented elderly and frail patients on that trial. Uh, for re if anybody wants to ask about that at the end, I'd be happy to go into the reasons why. It's not unusual that that happened. Um, but anyway, it did. So elderly and frail patients don't get chemotherapy beforehand. They just get the surgery and then the chemotherapy, which is a problem because the people most likely to not be able to tolerate the chemotherapy after the ordeal of surgery are the elderly and the frail. So many elderly and frail patients get no chemotherapy at all. They just get the surgery. So wouldn't it be better to give them some chemotherapy first? There is a distinct possibility that probably yes. So Foxtrot 2 will look into that. Being led both of these trials in leads by a fantastically talented um, bowel cancer doctor and researcher, Professor Jenny Seligman. And she is being assisted from Birmingham by Dion, Professor Dion Morton, who ran the first Foxtrot trial. So Foxtrot 2, as I say, is going to look at can frail, elderly and frail patients also benefit from having chemotherapy first, then surgery, then chemotherapy. And Foxtrot 3 is going to say, well, let's look at those fitter and healthier patients. Actually, what if we gave them even more chemotherapy before their surgery? Would that help? So they're going to get two chemotherapy drugs instead of the normal one. And we're really excited about these trials. They've still got a long, long way to run, but we are really hopeful that they are going to make a big impact and really help to change bowel cancer treatment in this country. So just to conclude then, what, what happened to Isaac Berenblum? So that was 1929 when he made his discovery. Uh, he stayed in Leeds for a couple more years and he went on to do even more mustard gas research uh, and also did some very important bladder cancer research as well. Um, and then his mustard gas research, he discovered that even more dilute amounts of mustard gas would still have a very positive effect in inhibiting cancer. And then he stayed till 1936, and then he got an invitation to go down to Oxford to become a research fellow down there, and he must have really impressed them down there because within two years he'd become the head of the Oxford University Research Centre. And it is there that he did his famous work. He is not remembered as contributing to chemotherapy, 
He is remembered for his research contribution to an area called carcinogenesis, which is how the first normal healthy cell becomes a cancer cell. What is that process? Why does it happen? The very beginnings of trying to understand that were in the 1930s, and Isaac Bernblum was at the head of that um, push to discover what causes a, a healthy cell to become a cancer cell. He stayed there for 10 years and then moved across the Atlantic to become a special fellow at the National Cancer Institute in Maryland. Didn't stay for long. Two years later, came back across the Atlantic, ended up in Israel, where he became the head of the Department of Experimental Biology at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot. And in 1974, gets the biggest accolade of his life when he was awarded the Israel Prize for Biology. Now, I mentioned that uh, essay that he wrote about his life, or read the quote about the chap that came to visit him. Um, he concludes that essay with this paragraph. I do not feel that I have changed so much. I still experience some sense of adventure every morning when I set out to work, just as I did on that first day close to 50 years ago when I began my life as a scientist. Trying to discover the unknown is still exciting. Can't find out a huge amount about him as a person. I know he likes chess. That's about the only thing I've managed to find. He, he competed in the Leeds Chess Leagues. Yeah. Uh, but he does seem to have been a lovely man from what I can gather. And I am very pleased to dedicate this presentation to him. He reached the grand old age of 97 and died in the year 2000. And that brings us to the end of our talk. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Andy. Do, do we have any questions in, in the room? We, we also have uh, quite a lot of people watching at home, and there, there may be some questions. Uh, not so far. Not so far. Not, not yet. Do, do, does anybody here have any uh, anything they'd like to put to Andy? Yes. Um, kind of listen, and, um, I listened to my last debate. History of cave science. But I look, my case study was Fritz Hart. So I looked at the uh, human welfare. All right, yeah. So that's why I'm really interested. Okay, all right. so, Did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, a family member was most of us as well. That kind of right. propelled that little case study. So I've got a million of questions that are probably not appropriate. For this space, but but thank you, it's really interesting. But I am trying to get the proposal together. And I can't I can't leave it alone. But um, I just want to say a really big thank you that all the devastation, but she still get really moved by by chemical warfare. That there's always something in science that can flip. Them. So thank you, but I feel really moved by your talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, a little silver lining to come out of all that devastation. Yeah, and just um, you know, the dedication because I, I was actually looking at the morality of science, science and scientists to make that choice. And uh, as a general face, I was known for some countries, World War One, chemical warfare, World War Two. You know, but she's attributed to what he died in his family got a man to buy. He's a creative development by other people. So it's in that science is such um, mm -hmm. a very precarious really good intention. Well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't spot any holes in it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well people ask a question, can I just turn the microphone to the people who can't hear what you're asking? All I'm asking is, does Yorkshire Cancer Research only work in Yorkshire, or does it work, is there a Lancashire Cancer Research, or even... And Midlands Cancer Research, how does it fit in? Okay. So, okay, yeah. so there are not many regional cancer charities left now. So, so when we set up in Midlands, we're with a Yorkshire Council, which is in Ireland and So, we're just a Yorkshire with an umbrella organisation. And that organisation set up the regional cancer is pretty much every part of the country. So, we're all one of many at that point. 
But slowly over the decades, most of them have emerged or taken over or been part of the journalism, and there are very few left there. So, um, I believe I'm right saying that uh, the Tenebus um, charity in Wales, yeah. I think that's a fairly newly established charity, but came out of, I think, the background of having been one of these regional charities. I think I'm right. Like, yeah, the um, but yeah, there are people in there. So we managed to survive, I think, because. Say on average, Yorkshire people are more proud of Yorkshire than some other people in the part of the living. Get a cheer from the audience. But, um, yeah, I think we've just got more natural pride and affinity to our county than people in lots of other counties in the country probably have. So I think for that reason, we've managed to sustain ourselves and keep going. We were one of many. Uh, one of one, really. These are questions on chat. I'll. First of all, uh, ask you the medical question, and then there's another one about Baron Bloom as a person. So I'm not sure why this question's been asked, but did the mice have hair on their bodies or were they shaved first? And another question, for a patient who has mustard gas and had respiratory failure, would they be protected from lung cancer? Okay, very interesting. So I don't know about whether the mice were shaved or not. I really don't know. I have not the original report where you wrote. So the maybe something in that. So if I can find anything about that, I'll report back. Um, many people, the respiratory illness that was caused was so severe that many people unfortunately died very quickly from that from those respiratory issues. If they managed to survive the respiratory issues, would they be protected from? Well, that's a that's a dashed good question, and I don't know the answer. I'm afraid again, the one I'm going to have to. Have to mug up on and, and come back to you. Uh, two more questions. Uh, did the Bari report accelerate the research on mustard gas, or didn't it do that? Uh, it, uh, from what I've read, it helped. So it was another little bit of evidence that, that made them think, yes, we're absolutely on the right track. So it did have an, an impact, but much, much smaller than most people would believe. Right. And then a question about Baron Bloom as a person. Uh, Alan M asked, did no, Isaac no, Berenbaum no, take no, an active interest in the Jewish life in Leeds? That's another great question. As, as I say, it's really, unfortunately, quite difficult to find much out yes. about him. Um, so I don't know, but again, I can, I'll try and find out more. Sally Brodetsky, who was Professor of Applied Mathematics in Leeds, his wife made the name of Baron Bloom, and I'm not oh, sure they well, I guess they were they were related. Right, that is very interesting. That might be a way for me to find out more. Strong connection, right? But actually, was very much involved in the fight Right. Okay, it's given me an avenue of uh, to explore. Thank you. Can I just ask, was was Baron Bloom actually living in the before he went to the was he you No, I think if they were living in Bristol, from what I can gather, again, there's so little information, but it seems they've got one report saying that when they arrived from Belgium, they moved to Bristol. Whether they then moved as a family from there to Leeds or whether he just ended up in Leeds and the family stayed in Bristol, I'm not sure. Um, That's interesting because the weather not in refugees. Oh, sorry. Talking to the microphone. Thank you. And I was just wondering, uh, because Leeds during World War I had a lot of uh, Belgian refugees, so I wonder through the grapevine if that's how it came up. It it's a surprise that it went to Bristol first and not uh, to Leeds. So if the family did know, that could be well why yeah. the reason why they went to Leeds, or it could have been perhaps that they knew people in Leeds, and that's why mm. he ended up. So it's mum and dad had stayed in Bristol, but he came here because of that link, possibly. Yeah, and um, maybe the work, the University of Leeds, or Camden Mount as well, which is interesting. You described how. Uh, uh, the mustard gas ameliorated the problem, but you described the phenomena whereby uh, after three attempts it no longer was effective because of the great multiplication. How's that, how's that actually been uh, ameliorated these days? What, what's, what's the so, um, in the early days, they managed kind of a solution, right? So, in the very early days, they were giving one type of chemotherapy 
and then it would fail. It caused all signs, kinds of side effects, but then it would fail. And then they would give it another type of chemotherapy for another period, and eventually it would fail. And then they would give a third, and it would fail. That was that was the early procedure. They quickly realized that that was not the most effective way to go. So they started to give multiple types of chemotherapy all in one go right at the start. And that, although being very, very hard on the patients, was actually more effective in beating. It, it, would, it had the possibility to beat the cancer before any cells develop the immunity. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was the approach. Now there's all kinds of research going on now into kind of, chemo kind of chemotherapies, because they do cause a lot of side effects, can do, um, and to more effective types of chemotherapy. But eventually chemotherapy is going to be a drug of the past that we no longer use. Um, other treatments like immunotherapy will, will have taken its place. Um, but for the time being, we still use, as I said, about, about a third of all patients receive it, so it's still very widely used. But I think over time, it's something that we look back on and it was useful at the time, but we don't need it anymore, hopefully. Mm -hmm. What actually is mustard gas? And where does it come from? Um, I'm getting so many good questions. <laughs> I've <don't laughs> <know, it's> <laughs> You're too intelligent, this audience. This is, um, I don't know whether it's manufactured or whether it's naturally mm. occurring. And that's mm. a sad omission on my part. So mm. again, mm. another area that I need to move up in. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so chemical formulas. Yeah, yeah. Mm. mean much to me, I'm afraid. I need, I, I need some expert help if anybody understands chemical formulas. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. More homework for me to do. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes um, um, chemotherapy seems to vary a lot in its effects. I, I mean, not just its cancer beating effects or not, but the, all the side effects. And some people seem to be completely overwhelmed by it and unable to do anything and terribly depressed and so on. And others seem to go and get a treatment and come straight back to work. Is that because there's different sorts or is it to do with the metabolism of the person? It's a mixture of both things. So there was over a hundred types and some of them have more impact than others in terms of side effects. But it's also down to the person. We're all individual, we're all got very different metabolisms, we all respond very differently. So it's a mixture of what the chemotherapy that the person gets and how their and how much of that chemotherapy they get and then how their body responds to it. And like you say, for some people, you say it's a walk in the park, but they, they get through it absolutely no problem whatsoever. And I've had a couple of other people say, to be honest, I wished that I had died because the treatment was so absolutely awful and it lasted for oh, it can go on for months. Um so yeah, for some people it's it's just appalling. Um, mm -hmm. and for others it's not a problem. So yeah, it depends what give it a be you get and how you respond to it. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Um, I've got another question about animal research mm -hmm. because I know that there's strong lobby to say that it's not practical or sensible. <laughs> Well, not so much not practical, but not appropriate to test on animals, not both for the, the effects of the animals, but also because animals and humans are very different. So therefore, you can't really do that anyway. And there are other ways of finding out the effectiveness of treatment. What is the view of yourself and Yorkshire Cancer Research on this? So system? we are absolutely of the view that it should be minimised. And we haven't funded any animal related research for, I think I'm right in at least five years. And our stance now is that if somebody came to us with a proposal which involved animal research, if we thought it was brilliant and therefore was worth the suffering of the animals, then we would still fund it. Theoretically, we still would fund it. But we haven't seen any proposals like that, as I say, for five years. And we would rather fund proposals which don't include animals. So yeah, that's our situation. Okay. Okay, well, that looks like uh, all the questions. So uh, I'd just like to say, Andy, thank you very much for coming tonight and giving us the very interesting talk. Okay. It's something a little bit uh, different for, for us as a, as a historical society, uh, but I'm sure we've, we've, we've all enjoyed it. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's good. Thank you. Thank you.